All right, everyone. We still have a handful of people we're expecting to join in, but I think we will go ahead and get started now. Um, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today for the second of four virtual lunch and learns that we're going to be hosting this Skajakwita September. Um, we'd also like to start with thanking some of our sponsors who have made Skajakwita September possible. Many thanks to the Rich Family Foundation, Labatt USA, M&T Bank, and Life Storage for their support. Today, we'll be hearing from Buffalo Niagara Waterkeepers Ecological Program Manager, Holly Kirstner, and Volunteer Coordinator, Brittany Anderson. Holly will be giving an update on a few of the programs and projects that Waterkeeper is currently working on in the Skajakwita watershed. And Brittany will be giving an overview of some of the different opportunities for volunteering and ways that you can help support Skajakwita and other watersheds in our region. A few bits of housekeeping before we get started. Today's webinar, if everyone heard, is recorded. Um, so if for anyone who wasn't able to join us today or wants to head back and hear something, we will be sharing the recording of this webinar shortly after we conclude here. Um, anyone is welcome to use the Q&A or the chat feature to enter questions. We do have some time reserved at the end of this presentation for all of those questions. So please enter those in again, either using the Q&A button or the chat feature, and we will get to those. Let's see if we can get our slides to progress. Here we go. All right. So before we jump right in, bear with me one second. All right. I just wanna talk a little bit for anyone who's new to Waterkeeper about who we are and the work that we do and what um, what services we provide to the Western New York community. So we have been around for just under 35 years. We get to celebrate our 35th anniversary next year. Um, and we're an environmentally focused nonprofit organization whose mission is to really protect and restore our waterways, our surrounding ecosystems for the benefit of current and future generations. Our work is really fourfold. We work on protecting the water, we work on restoring um, our waterways and the surrounding ecosystems. We connect people to their waterways and we work to inspire both economic activity as well as community engagement um, around our waterways. So with that, I will pass it over to Holly Kissner who will talk more about the projects that we currently have, um, or sorry, I'm sorry, a little bit more about the watershed that we're gonna be reviewing um, in today's webinar, the Skajakwita Creek Watershed. Thanks, Danny. You could just advance the slide. Awesome. So building off what Danny said, sort of introducing Waterkeeper, our work covers the Niagara River and Lake Erie watershed. And in order to understand our work at any scale, whether it's large scale or specific to Skajakwita Creek, which is why we're all here, it's important to understand a watershed. So a watershed is the land area that drains all streams, rainfall, and stormwater to a shared body of water. So that's to say if a drop of rainwater falls on the land and assuming the ground is completely saturated, the water will run downhill and, until it ends up in a body of water, such as the Niagara River. And thus that area of land is the Niagara River watershed. So it gets a little tricky because watersheds nest inside each other. So look, for example, at the sub-watershed map that I have there. Um, rain falling in South Buffalo would first run into the Buffalo River. So South Buffalo is within the Buffalo River watershed. But water in the Buffalo River ultimately flows to Lake Erie and then the Niagara River. So South Buffalo is nested inside the Niagara River watershed. And as we all know, the Niagara River flows between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. So it's all connected to the Great Lakes watershed too. Danny, can you advance to the next slide? And I'm droning on about this because understanding the nested systems of watersheds connects our local actions to bigger scale water quality issues and solutions. And at Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper, we use watersheds to help us understand why our waterways are in the state that they are in, because the practices on land affect the body of water at the heart of whatever watershed you're in. And so back, as I'm sure you know, the Niagara, uh, the Skajakwita Creek watershed is densely populated from the headwaters in Lancaster to the mouth of the city of Buffalo. And this watershed has a lot of challenges that cause impairments to the creek. So Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper is working hard at a lot of different programs and projects that address some of the challenges throughout the watershed. And with that, I'll kick it back to Brittany to talk about some of our programs. 
Thanks, Holly. Um, so the first program that I would like to talk to you guys about is our River Watch program. So the River Watch program consists of concerned community members trained to use the latest technology to gather important water quality data in the Niagara River watershed. Uh, volunteers conduct uh, monthly monitoring of streams in their neighborhood and also provide a network of eyes on the water uh, to report pollution or improper land uses on these waterways. Uh, next slide, Danny, please. Uh, three specific projects under our River Watch program that I'd like to touch on today. Um, they are first the baseline water chemistry sampling project, um, staff bacteria sampling, and water reporter. Next slide, Danny, please. So our baseline water chemistry monitoring. Uh, the volunteers in this project collect data on pH, total dissolved solids, uh, temperature, conductivity, dissolved oxygen, and turbidity. There are six teams total that go out and sample, and we have teams that sample in the Skajakwita Creek border. Uh, some of these locations are Skajakwita Creek at West Ave Bridge, Skajakwita Creek at North Creek, South Creek Park, Skajakwita Creek at Ledyard Ave, and areas in Forest Lawn Cemetery. Uh, volunteers also collect site observations. Uh, these include the flow of the waterway, if there are unusual smells or water appearances, and were there any algal uh, growths present. Volunteers have been taught how to identify harmful algal blooms and how to report them. Uh, next slide, Danny, please. The second project is our staff-led uh, bacteria sampling. Sewage pollution is one of the greatest ongoing threats to the Great Lakes in our regional waterways. Most old, older cities and municipalities in New York State, including the cities of Buffalo and Niagara Falls, have combined sewer system. This means that the sewage from commercial and residential areas are combined with stormwater runoff before entering a treatment facility. Uh, normally this works as, works as engineered, however, when an intense storm event occurs, the sewer system is overwhelmed. Uh, this results in a portion of the combined storm and sanitary water from not entering the treatment facility and discharging into our uh, local water bodies. Next slide, Danny, please. Um, so in this map, this shows all of the combined sewer overflows and sewer system overflows along Kajakwita Creek. Uh, we can see that in the city of Buffalo towards the mouth, there are a lot of combined sewer overflows present. And as we move out the city towards the head uh, headwaters in Lancaster, there are mainly sewer system overflows. So staff are able to go out in two conditions, dry weather and wet weather. Uh, dry, is a, dry weather is 72 hours with no rain and a wet weather condition is five five hours of sustained rainfall or a half an inch of rain within 24 hours of sampling. Uh, next slide, Danny, please. This graph shows the average E. coli counts on dry and wet weather days. Uh, we can see that on wet weather sampling days, the E. coli counts are significantly greater uh, than on dry weather sampling event due to these overflows. Uh, next slide, Danny, please. The samples are then analyzed for E. coli using in-house uh, Coliscan Easy Gel. Results are typically available after 48 hours. These results are then compared to the US EPA beach action value of 235 E. coli per 100 milliliters for a single sample. Uh, we then post our bacterial monitoring updates to swim guide to better inform water recreationists. Next slide. The next program that I like to talk about is Water Reporter. So Water Reporter is an app created for citizen science to share their valuable findings with local experts. Uh, when you're outside, especially near a waterway, um, all volunteers really need to do is take a picture, almost like a social media, do a hashtag, um, and then create a post in Water Reporter. Uh, things to consider are, do you see some wildlife creatures? Um, is there plastic trash or debris near the waterway? Um, is the water color different than usual? Um, are there non-native 
plant species or animals near the waterway? Um, and also, is there a combined sewer overflow that, that we just talked about? So all of these you can upload with the hashtag um, in Water Reporter. And again, these volunteers are our eyes on the water. Uh, next slide, Danny, please. Um, our next program is Living Shorelines. So Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper launched our Living Shoreline program within the Niagara River Greenway in 2013. Uh, this program was developed in response to the need to restore the quality and function of shoreline habitat within our region. Uh, conventional management of waterfront properties often utilize hardened uh, structures and they typically mow to the edge um, in some of these areas. This picture, these pictures um, show the before and after of a living shoreline project that we uh, did in Forest Lawn. Um, sites in our Living Shoreline program have to be maintained, um, and we do this through our Restore Coral program. Next slide. Our Restore Coral program is for volunteers interested in planting native trees, shrubs, perennials, and aquatic plants, caring for bird boxes and trails, and taking part in stewardship of dynamic living shorelines, as I just talked about. Uh, one of our active projects in the Skajakwita Creek Corridor is in Forest Lawn Cemetery. Uh, Skajakwita Creek runs through Forest Lawn Cemetery and our projects help create a scenic environment for visitors uh, while also helping to improve flooding conditions. Uh, we currently have a Restore Core event at Forest Lawn as a part of Skajakwita September. Um, this is now going to be on September 23rd from 10, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m or 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, and tickets are available. You can just scan that QR code and it'll take you right to our registration page. Volunteers will be working as a team to load, transport, and install wetland rock sock plants within an established living shoreline. You may be asking, okay, what is a rock sock? Well, rock socks are novel wetland planting techniques uh, developed during the Buffalo River restoration. It involves filling biodegradable burlap bags with a special planting substrate and planting them with wetland plugs in a nursery setting. These plants are left to grow in the nurseries for several weeks um, and develop dense root systems before they are installed into shallow water areas at restoration sites. Next slide. And then the last program that I'll talk about is our cleanups program. Uh, so our spring sweep is our largest event, volunteer event of the year and is a part of our annual, the annual Great Lakes cleanup uh, where we are joined by volunteers across the Great Lake region and removing litter from our shorelines and protecting our waterways. Uh, we officially launched our digital data collection efforts by using the Clean Swole app uh, created by Ocean Conservancy, uh, which directly connects the information we collect locally to their largest marine debris database in the world called TIDES. This allows our data to be instantly accessible and help to support our work to address the root causes of litter pollution and can be used to address policy and advocacy efforts. Uh, for the jacket of September, we recently had a sweep that happened on September 7th, and it went great. Um, the Skajakwita sweep is also part of the International Coastal Cleanup. Um, volunteers across the globe are collecting uh, litter using the Clean Swole app. Um, and at this event, we had two different sites. One was at the Japanese Garden. One was along Peter Street. In total for this event, we had 33 volunteers and we collected a total weight of 202 pounds of trash, which is really awesome. We also had volunteers utilize the Clean Soul app at this sweep and there were 118 pounds of the 202 that was collected via the King Swell app. We had find out that the top five items um, that was reported were cigarette butts, food wrappers, plastic foam pieces, bottle caps, and then other ways. So there's always ways to get involved, even um, when there are not public hosted BNW events, you can always get out and do a solo sweep, which is a cleanup effort that you complete on your own time. So with that, I will pass it back over to Holly. Thank you. Brittany. So 
Brittany just did a great summary of a lot of our larger programs and how they relate to Skajakwita. And I'm going to talk about some of our specific projects. Some of them um, are larger than Skajakwita, but they do overlap like this one. The first project I want to talk about is the City of Buffalo Coastal Resiliency Study. This study is an evaluation of Lake Erie, the Lower Niagara River, Skajakwita Creek, and Buffalo River shorelines. In recent years, there's been extensive flooding along several Great Lakes, Buffalo included. And while Great Lakes water levels are, and trends are cyclical, we understand that climate change is likely to exacerbate storms and floodings. And that's why Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper is working with Ramble Engineering Firm, the City of Buffalo, and the Ralph Wilson Jr. Foundation to explore climate resilient approaches for future shoreline restoration and development in the city. So this project is already underway. It's an approximately a two year project and it will end next year. All right, Danny, you can switch to the next slide. So as part of the study objectives for this project, we are evaluating a variety of climate driven coastal vulnerability scenarios. We are evaluating this to prepare for major flooding events so that we aren't taken by surprise when they happen and key asset information will be available for rapid decision making for folks who work at the city of Buffalo and have to respond to emergencies and large flooding storm events like this. The ultimate end goal is to identify implementable projects to protect the most significant and vulnerable assets in the project area. So a big aspect of all of this is water modeling. In addition to Ramble, we are working with environmental consultants, DHI. They're um, experts in water modeling. They work internationally. And we are looking at flooding both as it currently happens and during climate change scenarios. So what's important to note is that the flooding we're looking at isn't just rain or snow melt. In particular, we're modeling a water phenomena that Buffalo experiences, seiche events. So for those of you who don't know what seiche events are, when fall and winter storm happens, fall and winter storms happen, wind whips from the west over Lake Erie. And Lake Erie is so shallow that it almost acts kind of like a sloshing bathtub. You can see the graphic on the screen here. The water presses against Buffalo and causes flooding. And meanwhile, the water levels on the opposite side of the lake, Toledo, drop dramatically. So the water is basically like sliding towards Buffalo, being pushed by the wind. Uh, for example, there was a 14 foot difference between Buffalo and Toledo during a November storm event in 2020. And how this relates to Skajakwita is that the Seisha effect is so strong and Lake Erie water narrows so dramatically when it flows into the Niagara River Strait that this effect is felt in the lower Skajakwita Creek. So you can see the map on the right side of the screen there um, where I've put an arrow towards lower Skajakwita. So this, um, the lower part of Skajakwita is a part of this Buffalo Coastal Resiliency Study and we have flood modeling uh, occurring there. Danny, you can go to the next screen. So if you are interested in seeing some, um, if you're interested in seeing some of the flood modeling that's been done in the lower Skajakwita, you can come see us at the Galleria Mall next Thursday, September 21st. I know the Galleria Mall is an odd place to say, come see Buffalo and Niagara Waterkeeper. Um, but fun fact, the Galleria Mall is actually built on top of Skajakwita Creek, which is why we chose it for an event. Uh, we will be there between 4.30 and 7.30, so stop on by to um, talk to us about all things Skajakwita, but among these many things, we will have VR goggles from our water modeling consultant, DHI, and you can try on the VR goggles and see in 3D from a street view what some of the flooding will look like in the lower Sk Skajakwita as they've currently been modeling it. You can scan the QR code there for more information if you're interested. All right, we can go to the next project. So the next project is what we call the 1135 project. Um, Buffalo and Niagara Waterkeeper and the Army Corps of Engineers uh, in this July signed a federal cost share agreement for a feasibility study to evaluate opportunities for ecosystem restorations 
that enhance or offset uh, impacts from a historic Army Corps of Engineers flood risk management project along Skajakwita Creek and the town of Chitawaga. So you can see a photo here of our executive director, Jill, shaking hands with uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and some wonderful partners there that all helped make the signing of this agreement happen. Danny, you can go to the next slide. So what is this, what is this all about? Uh, what do we mean by offsetting impacts from a historic Army Corps flood risk management project along Army, uh, along Skajakwita Creek? So the Army Corps built a flood risk management project in the mid-1970s and early 1980s in the town of Chitawaga. The project impacted about 1.8 miles of the main creek stem and 4.3 miles of the tributaries to the creek. And the project was intended was a result of um, there was a lot of pretty impactful and economically expensive flooding that happened in the town of Chitawaga. So they, they wanted to address this. And as part of addressing it back in the 70s and 80s, they channelized the creek. And the creek um, has been impacted as a result of that channelization. Some of the impacts the creek has experienced is altered flow regimes. There's a degradation of water quality, a loss of wetland and riparian habitat. There's a proliferation of invasive species. You can see in the photo on the top left side of the screen there, uh, that's an aerial image of the Chictawaga Town Park. And you can see the creek there, it's extremely straight. It doesn't even look like a natural creek. It almost looks like a road. And that's pretty unhealthy um, for a creek to be straightened. And um, parts of the shoreline have been hardened as well. So a lot of unintended negative side effects as a result of that. And you might be thinking, well, why did they do this project in the first place if it had so many negative impacts? And I'll reiterate again that it really was unintended. When this happened in the 1970s and 80s, we really didn't know better about working. We didn't have a lot of engineering information about working with nature as kind of against nature. Um, it, it was the result of the best we knew at the time to mitigate flooding that was truly impacting people negatively. But now we know a lot more about probably better solutions to address flooding like that. Danny, you can go to the next slide. So because we've learned a lot in the last couple of decades about working with nature, the Army Corps of Engineers actually has a regulatory mechanism or an authority provided by Section 1135 of the Water Resources Development Act. Um, <laughs> that basically allows them to look at projects of the past and explore the ways to improve them. So that's why we call this the 1135 project is because that's the regulatory mechanism that allows us to go back and look at these projects that are considered done and effective, but we recognize like there's some unintended impacts that we can go back and address now that we know more. So in this case, we're making a plan for ecosystem restorations that could enhance or offer offset the footprint of this historic flood risk management project. So maybe that could mean creating wetlands, maybe that could mean adding plants that are good for habitat. You can see some areas on this map here that might qualify. We will see, that's all a part of this um, agreement that we just signed and the feasibility study that the Army Corps of Engineers is kicking off. And I wanna say that we were able to do this with help from great partners like the DEC and Went Foundation and the Wilson Foundation. They, those three entities brought money to the table so Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper could partner with the Army Corps of Engineers. And this next phase of the project, while it's just a feasibility study will take about two years, but if we identify feasible projects, that could unlock this next phase where there is up to 10 million federal dollars that could be used for implementation. So I really want to reiterate that while you might not be super excited about just another study, um, it is really exciting because it basically puts us on these train tracks that are part of a federal process that has some really cool opportunities for restoration. So in two years, we'll have a much better sense of like what those possibilities are. Danny, next slide, please. 
Oh, one more thing. So about that 1135 project, if you come to the mall next Thursday, um, our partners from the Army Corps of Engineer project team will be there with us. So if you have more questions or are interested in learning more, come see us next Thursday. Okay, now you can go ahead. <laughs> So this is the last project I want to talk about. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on in this Kajakwita Creek corridor, both um, internally from a waterkeeper side of things, but also we have recognized that a lot is going on in this Kajakwita corridor being led by folks outside of Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper too. So we're tuned in to the proposed 198 expressway downgrade. Uh, Gold Bike Buffalo has some work in this Kajakwita corridor. DEC obviously doing a ton of work, watershed wide. Um, Buffalo Sewer Authority has a long term control plan that is intending to address some of those CSOs that Brittany was talking about. So, all of these projects from all these different entities, including Waterkeeper, uh, relate to Creek Health. And Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper recognized that. And we recently went after and received funding from NOAA to take a step back and look at the creek more holistically and be able to consider all of the work that's sort of happening along it. And as part of this funding, we're going to create a plan for Skajakwita Creek restoration that is watershed wide, community driven and actionable. And this is for a three year project that will end in June of 2026. What do we mean by watershed wide? So of course it's going to be watershed wide from the headwaters in Lancaster to the mouth um, in the city of Buffalo. It's all about making connections. We are going to look at the system as a whole. A lot of people live downstream from upstream impacts. So it's impossible to look at the problem, the problems and their solutions for the creek in isolation. And that means including, and especially the buried section of the creek between Chictawaga and Forest Lawn. Um, most of you on the call might must know that um, in the 1920s, Skajakwita Creek was buried between uh, Forest Lawn and the Chictawaga border underneath the east side of Buffalo because of sanitation concerns over a hundred years ago now. Um, and the creek remains buried underneath that section of the city. And we, at Waterkeeper think that's an important piece of creek restoration that has been ignored or not as much attention as other parts of the creek. And we would definitely want to include that in our Skajakwita Creek restoration plan. Another way that we mean it's watershed wide is we're going to build on the work that's already been done and is currently on, um, ongoing, both internal and external to Waterkeeper. We want to do our due diligence to look at the work that has already been done more cohesively and identify gaps and maybe pull out things that are mutually reinforcing as priorities from some of this historical work that's happened along the creek. Okay, Danny, next slide. So what do we mean by creating a plan that is um, community driven? Well, as part of the creation of this plan, we will also create a Skajakwita Creek Restoration Community Advisory Group. The Community Advisory Group will guide the creation of the restoration plan and ensure it is as transparent and accessible as possible and is driven by the needs and concerns of those closest to the creek. So like I said, there's a lot of people who live in close proximity to the creek and their voices are extremely important when we think about creek restoration. Waterkeeper wants the plan to be meaningful, not just Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper's priorities, but the community's priorities. So as part of this, we're partnering with community members and organizations to help amplify our restoration work in different neighborhoods. And community advisory group members will also advise on community engagement best practices to ensure that we're actually reaching people and addressing relevant community priorities. Next slide, Danny. And what do we mean by actionable? So as part of this work, Waterkeeper will audit, summarize, and share information regarding remediation and restoration efforts and studies to date. Like I said, lots of work has been done already, and we want to create something that's mutually reinforcing and consistent with existing work, so it's more likely to be implemented. We're also interested in exploring the feasibility of removing the Grant Street finger dam. 
the dam, if you're familiar with it, you can sort of see it as you drive along the 198 or if you're on the Jesse Kriegel pathway. Uh, it's a barrier to fish, pa fish passage and it collects unsightly debris. People have sort of talked about the removal of this dam for a long time. Um, just as a, as a dream. But as part of this project, we're going to follow up on kind of those pie in the sky ideas that have been previously tossed around and explore their feasibility. And as a result of all of this work, uh, we will, it will all result in a priority list of transformational habitat restoration projects that can hopefully be teed up for near term implementation. And that's all I have, Danny. All right. A huge thanks to Holly and Brittany for sharing a lot of that information. Um, before we get into the questions that have been sent in, I just want to take a moment and go over kind of what else we have going on for Skajakwa to September. Um, crazy to think we're just about the midway of the month point, but there's still a whole bunch on this um on the calendar coming up. So next week we've got the third lunch and learn, and that one is going to focus on some bringing in some of those partners that Holly had mentioned to kind of talk about the work that they're doing in the Skajakwita Creek Corridor. Um, and then we have another Lunch and Learn slated for the end of the month on the 26th. That is going to be utilizing some really amazing drone footage that we've got. So you'll be able, able to kind of take a bird's eye view tour with us from the headwaters in Lancaster all the way along through the mouth of the creek. So we're really, really excited to share that footage. Um, so registration for both of those Lunch and Learns is still open at skajakwitaseptember.com. So please be sure to register for those if you have not already. Um, also, next Thursday, as Holly mentioned, we have the Share Your Skajakwita Vision event at Walden Galleria. We hope everyone will be able to come out for that. It's going to be, Holly, correct me if I'm wrong, 4.30 to 7.30? Yes, so 4.30 to 7.30. Um, find us right outside the Apple Store in Walden Galleria. We're going to have a whole bunch of fun tables set up and different activities. Like Holly mentioned, we'll have those VR goggles so that you're able to see some of that flood risk management solutions, um, as well as our partners from the Army Corps and a bunch of other activities kind of going on there. On the following Saturday, we're going to be, as Brittany mentioned, in Forest Lawn Cemetery um, doing our Restore Skajakwita Living Shorelines Restore Corps project with those rock socks, getting those in the ground. We do have about, last I checked, about 28 spots still open for that, but they are going quickly. So if you're interested and able to join us Saturday, September 23rd in the morning or in the early afternoon, please reserve your spot sooner rather than later. And then the month is going to end with our third annual Skajakwita scavenger hunt. Um, this is Waterkeepers fundraiser every year. It's a really fun way to just kind of explore different parts of the lower Skajakwita corridor. So it'll be taking place from about Niagara Street over to Main Street, up towards Kenmore Ave, down to West Ferry. And you're just going to grab a few of your friends and be able to explore all different parts of Skajakwita Creek and the Skajakwita corridor you may be familiar with, or you may discover some new things. Um, so so we encourage everyone to register for that if you would like to do so. The QR code is right there on your screen. Um, if anyone has any questions about anything that we have going on this Gajakwa to September, please post those in the Q&A feature. Um, but right now, I'll get into some of those questions. Give me one moment while I pull those up. All right, let's see here. So let's see, Holly, for you, um, how does the community advisory group work with the restoration planning? How does how do those pieces kind of work together and how can someone get involved if they want to have a role within that? That's a great question. Thanks, Danny. So Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper, we are the ones who will be responsible for coordinating and conducting the research, analyzing, writing, hiring technical consultants and all that for the Skajakwita Creek restoration plan. But as the plan is developed, the community advisory group members will weigh in um, throughout the Skajakwita Creek restoration planning process. So through a series of planned meetings um, with some sort of regular frequency, uh, Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper will provide updates on project progress and be able to solicit feedback on anything and, and, and everything that we're currently working on as part of the project including what's of greatest priority to the communities adjacent to Skajakwita Creek. 
like, and what information is more valuable to people. If we're like, we can do a study of this, or we can, let's say fish habitat or water quality, um, two different studies we could potentially be doing and community members can say, I'm more interested in this, or I'm more interested in that. Um, we community advisory group will also uh, help Waterkeeper decide what formats and channels the team should use to make findings accessible and relevant to other stakeholders too. So if folks are interested in getting involved in the community advisory group, we are still in the formation process of that right now. Uh, but I'm anticipating in November, there'll be some more information coming out to recruit folks. Some sort of small application, not burdensome, uh, that people will fill out because unfortunately we uh, we have to have a smaller group so that more people's voices can be heard as opposed to like a hundred people who can participate. But stay tuned if you follow Waterkeeper social media channels. We're going to really do our due diligence to get the word out um, when those opportunities become available. And I'd love if folks who are interested or feel strongly about this uh, apply. It would be great, great to have your feedback. That's great. Thanks, Holly. Brittany, we got a question for how can I learn more about getting involved in Riverwatch? Yes, yeah, so for Riverwatch, um, you would need to, um, the project coordinator of that is uh, our colleague Rob Cody, um, but you can absolutely send me a message as well. Um, the recruitment starts in early spring, so around March, there is a training that needs to happen for any Riverwatch volunteer. Um, so it is an in-depth um, training process about how to use the uh, probes and the different technology that it's involved with sampling. Um, and then sampling happens, starts in May and goes for six months into uh, late October. So again, if you're interested, we are completely full for this year, but if you're trying to uh, start River Watch for next year, please feel free to email me and then I can connect you with Rob Cody uh, to get you on the list for next year and get you um, signed up for that training. Awesome. And then also for you, Brittany, are there any other cleanups planned for this year? Uh, for this year specifically, there are no uh, no other like B and W hosted event cleanup. Um, but as I had mentioned briefly, there is always ways to get out in your community and do a cleanup. Um, those cleanup events are called solo sweeps. Um, which you will go out at any place at any time, which is really convenient for you, um, and do a cleanup. We highly recommend that you utilize the Clean Swell app. Um, what you would do is it's going to, you download the app, it's going to ask you for a group name. We ask that you put BNW in the location that you're cleaning up. So for example, if you're going to Delaware Park, you would put BNW Delaware Park Trash Avengers, for example, if that's what you want to name your group. That way, when you're collecting, we know that you are doing it on behalf of B&W, and then we can track those efforts. If you'll like, there's um, there's uh, handouts that I can provide. Just send me an email, say that you're interested in doing a solo sweep. We also have solo sweep kit giveaways um, where we give you a nice little cute kit. It's like a, a bucket um, to say from plastic pollution in plastic bags. It has tongs, it has hand sanitizer, um, gloves, everything that you would need to get started doing the cleanup on your own. Um, we just had one recently this past September or past Saturday, excuse me, on September 9th. It was a self sweep giveaway right here at our office for our open house. Um, but I am happy to connect with people who are interested in grabbing a kit and doing a, a solo sweep. Awesome. Thank you. And then Holly, one more question for you. What was the original point of the finger dam? That's a great question. I think <laughs> it's up for debate often, um, partially to collect debris, partially when there's the SAGE events and the water comes up from the mouth of Skajakwita Creek, as I was describing, and sort of backing up the creek to prevent that a little bit. It, As far as I'm concerned, it's kind of up for debate. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, that was all the questions that we had received, but everyone, if you have anything that comes to mind after this event, 
All of our emails are listed on the screen. Please do not hesitate to reach out to Holly, Brittany, or myself. Um, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. And thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. It was a pleasure, and we hope to see you at the next Lunch and Learns. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you all. Bye-bye.